Welcome back to Killer Fun, where we explore the intersection of crime and entertainment every other week. I'm Christy. And I'm Jackie. And today, today, we are talking about Netflix limited series, Ripley, season one, episode one, A Hard Man to Find. It's a more sinister take on Patricia Highsmith's enduring anti-hero Tom Ripley. Mm-hmm. So we talked about the beloved 1999 movie adaptation, The Talented Mr. Ripley. Yes. Back in 2021. Oh my God. And uh, this is a much smaller slice of that story. So we have a lot of different stuff to cover. Yeah. It won't be like an overlap so much. Mm -mm. No. Because I even went back and listened to our old episode. (laughs) I'm like, oh, hey, we're fun. (laughs) We forget sometimes. Yeah. (laughs) So, but there's not... We don't get nearly as far into the story mm-hmm. in this first episode. So there's, and it's, there are some cha- differences. So I'm sure there's some differences. Yeah. So the cast, let's talk about them. So it was put together by screenwriter Stephen Zalvan. Okay. Uh, who did, he did, he wrote Schindler's List oh. and The Night Of okay. for HBO. Okay. So gotcha. I was like, Oh, okay. There we go. Then we have Andrew Scott, mm-hmm. who plays uh, Tom Ripley. Now, Andrew Scott is 47. Mm-hmm. So he is much older than the Tom portrayed in the 1999 movie. This isn't a Tom stumbling into his psychopathy as a young man. This is a grown man looking for opportunities always. Yeah. It's a very different sort of take on things. So I thought that was interesting. But what else have we seen Andrew Scott in? Yeah, because he's got kind of a familiar face, but... Yes. So what makes him a good con man? Yeah, that's Because he's got that familiar face, so you feel like you could know him, but you could also lose him in a crowd kind of easy. Yep. He played Moriarty on Sherlock, so he mm-hmm. was the the villain there. And I don't know if you ever watched Fleabag. I did it not. Was raunchy and so funny, um, but he was the hot priest in that. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. So Johnny Flynn plays Dicky Greenleaf. Um, he starred in Lovesick, which was also on Netflix, mm-hmm. and he was David Bowie in Stardust. Oh, okay, mm-hmm. cool. Dakota Fanning is Marge Sherwood. Mm-hmm. Of course, she was a child star. Of course. Yes. We saw her in I Am Sam, Cat mm-hmm. in the Hat, stuff like that. Um, as she got older, she did things like The Twilight Saga mm-hmm. and then Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. So she's done lots of stuff. I, I always think of her from Friends. <laughs> she was in Friends? She has this like one small part in Friends when Monica and Chandler are moving and she's the little girl in the house. <gasps> yes. Oh my gosh. And she talks to Joey, Joey. Uh-huh. and helps him through it. Uh huh. And she's like, you know, you're acting, you're acting like an eight year old. And he's all like, well, what should I do? She says, well, I don't know. I am eight. <laughs> and it's adorable. Uh huh. Gosh, I completely forgot about that. <laughs> so funny. Kenneth Logren plays Herbert Greenleaf. He's not. Generally, an actor. He's a writer. And okay. He, he co wrote Gangs of New York. Oh, interesting. Mm-hmm. So it's interesting that they would put him on mm-hmm. um, screen. Anne Cusack is Emily Greenleaf. She's been around a long time. Yes. You know, famous relations, all that. She was in Multiplicity, which my husband and I love, A League of Their Own. Yeah. And The Informant, which we've covered on oh, the show yes. before. I like that one too. Mm hmm. And then uh, Bokeem Woodbine is Alvin McCarran, the private detective who finds Tom, the hard mm-hmm. man to the find. The hard man to find. Yeah, uh, in the bar. He was in Fargo season two, it's Spider Man Homecoming. And evidently he comes back in a later episode. I've only oh, watched good. the first two. So I've only watched the first one. one yeah. So. so there we go. But that's Maybe. all we're talking about today. Yeah. So perfect. It's good because sometimes if I if I watch more than the one, then I don't know where to stop. And yeah. it all runs together. <laughs> yes, so it does. Sometimes it's better for Jackie to just stop at one before we record. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That is fair. <laughs> Recap. <laughs> so we see that Tom Ripley is a con man. Long before he ever heard the name Dickie Greenleaf. Tom's modest existence is funded by small scams 
and is precarious, yet he doesn't jump at the big job that falls into his lap until it's clear that his current setup is being squeezed from multiple angles. Only then does he pursue an opportunity afforded by an older wealthy couple desperate to reunite with their estranged expat son. Tom is clearly out of his element in the luxurious travels, but is ready to embrace a finer way of life by the time he arrives to his destination in Italy. This adaptation of Tom Ripley is ruthless, and we see by the end of the first episode when Tom and Dickie are barely more than strangers that Tom has long-term plans that feel deeply sinister. Nice. Okay. There were thoughts. I had just a few. Yes, I, I had a few too. So, okay. so we, we should share our thoughts. Yes. Because there was time to have lots of thoughts. Uh, th- there were. This is... Mm-hmm. Okay, so the movie... I remember this. It was a long movie, but mm-hmm. it also felt rushed in some ways. Okay. Okay. So there was a lot to get in, even though it was like a two and a half hour movie yeah. and kind of long. There was a lot of information to get in so that you could really understand these characters yeah. well. Yet, this feels too slow. This feels the opposite problem. Uh-huh. Ex- exactly. Like, it's a little slow. We probably could have we probably could have kept going a bit. We could have... Yeah, yes. it could have been, you know, five or six episodes instead of eight. Yeah. And maybe that would have been yeah, I feel a better that. pace. Because it was, it was just, okay, you know, already with the film noir. Yeah. The, oh, I already yeah. have things with the film noir. And then the dialogue was neither plentiful or witty. And so sure. I was like, mm. thankfully some of the visuals were, were nice and mm-hmm. good storytelling in that way. But I was like... Oh, come on, guys. Let's go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Let's well, go. Here's the thing. In the movie, Dickie was magnetic. Oh, okay. Right? Yeah. Like, I hoped that when I watched the second episode, mm-hmm. I would see a little more of that, like, what draws you to Dickie? What made him... Um, I remember Gwyneth Paltrow's Marge talked about when... Dicky is paying attention to you. It's like the sun is oh, shining yeah. on you. Uh-huh. And when when he turns his gaze away, it's very cold. Yeah. In the darkness. I don't get that here. No, not like so much. at all in the first episode. I thought we would see more of it in the second episode. Not so much. Mm. Yeah. And you don't really understand. There was like a desperateness of Tom in the movie. That was sort of endearing, which kind of yeah. you could see why Dickie would want to take want to take care of him. Yeah, want to like put Tom under his wing yeah. and like care. And plus, it was a playmate. Yeah, these are men in their forties. Not that men in their forties don't need playmates, right? They do. Yes, yes. <laughs> but, in some way, but, I kind of appreciate them casting the older. I, I do because but, you know, but at the, yeah. at the same time, there's a little bit of that youthfulness that I miss Mm -hmm. in this particular interpretation. Anyway, thoughts. Thoughts. (laughs) There was a thought. (laughs) These are more specific thoughts. (laughs) Tom has professionally printed letterhead for the McAlpin Collection Agency. He's been running this con for a while and has put a lot of effort into it. I'm like, dude, put that effort into a real job. I mean, right? That's the thing. There's so many criminal enterprises, and you're like, if you could just do this under the law, yeah, you'd be very successful. Right. Why not start one? Yeah. There's plenty of people who are actually not sending the checks. Yeah, but I guess there's something easy about about conning the people who are because it's like a well, mailing list just right to your door. Yeah. Well, and he just doesn't have to answer to anybody. He doesn't have to answer to the laws. He doesn't have to follow the rules. Right. You know, there's a certain autonomy in that that people like. Yeah. I guess. I don't know. We'll get to the psychology of his camera later. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. I did think, wow, it's much harder to bring your computer with you when it's a typewriter. (laughs) Yeah. Like he's putting the typewriter into his bag and I'm like, (laughs) oh, that would be very hard and heavy. Uh-huh. Like, I'm glad my laptop is not that big. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And it does so much more. Yes, I thought they had to type that every time. Every time he had to type that letter. Oh, my gosh. He had to type it every time. And he was a hunting pecker. Oh, yeah. You had to be. There's not enough strength in your other fingers. This is true. To push those typewriter things down. You had to, like, 
Like it was like a muscle workout mm-hmm. to do those things. Yes. <laughs> It was as somebody who typed my college application on an actual typewriter. <laughs> I can concur. Yeah. <laughs> so Tom goes from his tiny one room place that's really dilapidated to the Greenleaf's opulent home. Mm-hmm. And I get that almost every city has, you know, disparity like this. Mm-hmm. But I'm always reminded and astounded that places like New York City have it in such close proximity to one another. Oh, yeah. Like, uh-huh. you can really get on the subway for 10 minutes, and it's a completely different world. Yeah, street yeah. by street almost in some areas. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Tom claims to be from New York but went to Princeton. Tom claims his parents drowned in a boating accident off a of Long Island Sound. We've seen Tom lie so much by the time he sits down to have a meal with the green leaves Mm -hmm. that I feel like anything I wrote down, I had to put Tom claims. Yeah. Yeah. Right. (laughs) Because I don't know if any of it's true. Any of it. Yeah. Who knows? And to that end, I wonder what was actually in aunt Dottie's letters. So she was sending Mm -hmm. him money and then he is like claiming that she's belittling him Mm -hmm. in her letters which is absolutely certainly possible. Mm -hmm. People do that. But we've seen Tom lie so much that I wonder if it's projection Mm -hmm. or what. Or what. Yeah. Yeah. And then only as Tom is introducing himself to Dickie on the beach as an acquaintance from a party, do I realize In 25 years of history with this character that I've known about this character, did I realize Tom Ripley might not be his real name? Oh. (laughs) (laughs) I just kind of took it at face value. The book is the The talented talented Mr. Mr. Ripley. Ripley. Tom Ripley is the the character. This is how he introduces himself, unless he doesn't. But but he could have. Who knows? Maybe that's part of why you cast the older because you're setting up the story to be like, this is not his first rodeo. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like this Tom Ripley may not be the guy that that's why Dickie's all like, huh, okay. Yeah. Are you? yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. There's this whole like, you don't look like I remember you looking. Okay. Uh-huh. You know? Right. Like, or a- just the, it's such a kind of banal name. Like, yeah. Okay. But like in the movie though, I think I remember they it was much more like I remember you. Like I know who you are. Oh, well, Tom was very much I remember you. Right. And he had to try and remind Dickie, Dickie of memories that he didn't actually have because in the movie they'd right. gone to college together. They'd gone to college together. Mm-hmm. But like yeah, but in this one it seems like Dickie has initial like serious skepticism about like the whatever is happening in the memories and mm-hmm. whatnot, you know, yeah. he may have, he may have done this before. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, almost certainly <laughs> <laughs> locations. It was largely filmed on location in New York and Italy. Tom's apartment was in Chinatown on Madison street. Mm-hmm. The antique store that he looks in the window late at night or something is in the West village. Okay. It was an empty location that they filled with stuff. The boat yard is the Navy yard. Yeah. And then, uh, the hotel Miramar, uh, was created with the exterior of a convent. And then they rented a private home to make the interior of the hotel. Mm -hmm. They did look on Ishia, the little island where the talented Mr. Ripley was filmed for the villa that Mm -hmm. is Dickie's home. But they found actually one in Capri Mm -hmm. that they liked better. Unfortunately, that particular villa had been subdivided. And so there were three different factions of one family living in this villa and they had to negotiate with all of them (laughs) in order to be able to use this home to cobble together Dickie's villa. That's so funny. Which is fabulous. And you get more beautiful, fabulous views of it in Uh the second episode. It's really very nice. Oh, man. So, and then... um, 
you know, we mentioned that it's in black and white. Yes. That it's kind of got a film noir, Mm -hmm. which is not your favorite. Yeah. Um, Feel to it. But NPR had an article by Linda Holmes um, about why she thought that that was uh, a good choice for this particular adaptation (laughs) of it. NPR likes the film noir? Blow me away. <laughs> I know. Shocker. <laughs> Shocker. <laughs> she liked it a lot because it really set it apart from the talented Mr. Ripley. Because yeah. Because that lush, beautiful Italian countryside is like a character in and of itself mm-hmm. in the talented Mr. Ripley. And Anthony Minghella, who directed the movie version of it, it, that version of it is really well beloved. And mm-hmm. in order to be able to differentiate it, this was a good kind of a good way to do it. They kind of make it a little more chilly by doing this. They can kind of play up the lifelessness mm-hmm. that's in Tom. There is a little something kind of dead about yeah. him mm-hmm. and you know, that his eyes look really kind of dark and yeah. Emotionless. Uh, because of the black and white. So, yeah, that makes sense. I was like, okay. I get it. I get it. I get it, but it's Italy and it's beautiful. I know. <laughs> I would like to see all the Italian colors. Thank you very much. Yes. Tom's a scammer. Oh, yes. Uh huh. So, the best way to get over being the victim of a scam is to not be a victim in the first place. Well, that would be fair. Yes. Uh-huh. So, consumerfinance.gov has some information that can be helpful. Oh, good. Because this sort of debt collector Mm -hmm. sort of scam is very common. Oh, yes. I've encountered it. Oh, have you? Oh, yes. I have a person. I mean, I wasn't scammed. Uh But but you knew somebody who was. Oh, no. I encountered it. Oh. They tried to scam me. Oh. Mm-hmm. And okay. I had a, I had a gotcha moment on the phone with them. <sighs> so you, yeah, I can tell my story, and and it, if it's helpful, but yeah, it, it, if you can avoid this, the debt collector thing right now is a big deal. Yeah, well, mm-hmm. yeah, because there's a lot of uh, debt to be collected. Right, but they also just try to make you think that you haven't paid when you have, right, or make you think uh-huh. an old account is open that has some a remaining balance. So, like, my quick story is that we owned a condo in North Beach in Corpus Uh, Christi. Right. And the electricity there is uh, privatized. So you go through whatever company you want to. We sold that piece of property, and that's it. Now, the law there is you can't have two accounts open on one. So often what happens is you don't necessarily close it, but you, you sell the house, and the other person opens it or takes over the account, and that's the end of it. So anyway, all of that's done and said and done. Years later now, I get a call of these debt collectors, quote unquote, saying that there's an open balance on this, on this account. Now they're using the name of the electron company that is current. It wasn't that name when I had the account there. Oh, so first of all, okay, I see, but it does happen. Companies merge, whatever. So I finally end up talking to this person and I'm like, well, She's like, can I get your, ver- I need to verify your information. And I was like, I need to verify your information oh. because this is a, this condo is sold and there is, should be no balance there. So I'm going to have to make sure I understand what account you're talking about. And she says, okay, well, she gives the, the address. This is a condo unit. I said, what condo unit? Well, all we have is this main address then this is not a correct debt collection because I didn't pay electricity for the entire complex. (laughs) So if you don't have a unit number, then you don't have a debt to collect. Click. Oh, (laughs) good for you. So that was my story. Wow. So you got to know, you got to (laughs) know. Well, and that's one of the first things that they say is make sure that it is actually a debt that you owe. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't sound familiar to you, then, you know, it's, it could be a scam. It could be fraud, Mm -hmm. but it, it could be a scam. So you should verify that it is actually something that you owe money for. Um, they are required to give you information. You did absolutely (laughs) the right thing by asking for them Mm -hmm. to, uh, verify what was going on Mm -hmm. with the account. Mm -hmm. What was, what was the address? What was their Mm -hmm. identifying information? Because they 
they are required to give you that information by law. And if they refuse to give it to you, then you don't have to. Yeah. Even. And they try to act like they're trying they're trying to confirm who you are. Well, yeah, they are because they're trying to scam you. Exactly. <laughs> but that goes both ways. So. Exactly. And they use high pressure techniques. Mm-hmm. They want things like money transfers yes. or prepaid cards. Those are a big red flag. They may threaten you with the jail time. Yep. Now, if what you owe is criminal fines or restitutions. There is a possibility you could be arrested for those things. It's not going to be the first thing they say to you, Mm -hmm. right? And if they say that they're going to out you to your family and friends about your debt, Mm -hmm. then that is also fake because they can talk to your family and friends, but only to try and find your location, mm-hmm. how to contact you. They cannot tell anybody that you have any kind of debt. Mm-hmm. If they call you at an inconvenient time before 8 a.m. or after 9 p.m., that's a big red flag. Yes. So uh, something you can do to protect yourself is request the caller's name, the company name, their street address, and a callback phone number. Yes. Good. Yes. Yes scammers are going to want you to immediately give them some sort of payment, Mm -hmm. right? They want, and they're going to try and make it sound as urgent as possible. If you can get all that information from them, there's a much higher chance that they're going to uh, be a legitimate collection. You can call the person that you owe money to, the creditor, the original creditor, Mm -hmm. and find out if it's been sold or if it's been turned over to a collection agency, they should have that information for you. So that's a way to do it. And if you feel like you've been scammed, you can submit a complaint with the Federal Trade Commission and or your state attorney general's office Mm -hmm. if you're in the U.S. Yep. That's good. And the other thing I did was I After Before I said the apartment stuff, I said, well, I have not received any mail on this. Can you please send certified mail? Yes. And they said no. (laughs) No. And really, she kind of said, no, well, that's why we're calling. I said, well, you can send certified mail. Well, can we just verify who you are? And that's when I turned the conversation around. Uh So, yeah, also request. They're supposed to send you hard copies. Mm -hmm. They can't just call you. They have to give you actual documents with the invoices and all of that Mm -hmm. stuff. So you can ask them to send certified mail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then if they do that and they're fraudulent, then it's mail fraud. Yep. So, yeah. So they... They're they're probably not going to do that. They're not going to do that. So, yeah. Yeah. Keep your eyes open, people. Mm -hmm. So here's how it works. Christy wrecks her search history. Hey, NSA, we promise it's nothing more nefarious than a podcast. To find out what's true, some of the psychological motivations behind the character's actions and real-life applications that relate to our topic. I have no idea what Christy decided to look up. Could be the same thing that captured my curiosity or something I never thought of. Is it true? Gosh, I hope not. (laughs) (sighs) A lot of it's not, of course. Of course. Of course. The Long Island Shipyard. Is Mm -hmm. that a real place? I mean, it sounds like a real place. It does sound like a real place. I, I feel like it must be some sort of real place, but I don't think it's the Long Island Shipyard. Okay. That's that's good because it was filmed at the the Navy Yard, mm-hmm. which does have like shipyard on yeah, the, in okay. big letters on the top of the. But Long Island Shipyard, there isn't one by that particular, by that particular name. name. There are a lot yeah. of shipyards in that area, yeah, but none with that kind of like generic name. I mean, it's a very good generic name. Sure, yeah, exactly. Well, and thusly on Herbert Greenleaf's card, he was supposedly the owner of the Long Island Shipyard. Um, The address was 322 North Harbor Drive, Brooklyn, New York. There is a Harbor Drive, but it's not north. There isn't a 322. Okay. And it's not a shipyard er area. It's residential. All right. Well, yeah, because I wouldn't expect a shipyard to be in the middle of Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. Right. right. (laughs) Well, I guess that could be an office address. Yeah. You know. Sure. (laughs) Sure. On the address for the card from the IRS agent. Mm -hmm. We see that it's ends in a couple of zeros and is on third Avenue. Okay. There is a IRS tax assistance office. Yeah. 
on Third Avenue <laughs> in Harlem, but it, the address doesn't end in two zeros, and it's a tax assistance office. It's yeah, not, not the kind the of place IRS. that they would have like agents. Yeah, that's fine. It's, it's amazing how close they get. Yes, right. To like make it seems so legit. Uh huh. Yeah, to make it yeah. feel so authentic so while you're watching it. Uh huh. The P.O. Box address for McAlpin Collection Agency is four twenty one Eighth Avenue. Mm-hmm. Is that a actual I, building? Oh man, I have no idea. Four twenty eight. Four twenty one Eighth Avenue. Oh, four twenty one Eighth Avenue. I'm gonna go no. Hmm. Actually, that one is correct. Oh, man. <laughs> it served as the uh, general post office building. That oh. was its name. It was Pennsylvania Terminal until 1918. Then it changed to the general post office building oh. until 1982 when it was renamed the James A. Farley Building. And it was in 1960 when this is taking place. It was the city's main United States Postal Service branch. Wow. So there would have been. How about that? Yeah. So I'm like, oh, they're so tricky. I know. I know. Because <laughs> there's no shipyard at, yeah. on Harbor Drive, but there is. What? Yeah. The post office. The post office. All right. So the postal delivery person handed Tom the mail. Uh-huh. Because he looked like he was supposed to be there at the doctor's office. He was trying to, he was pretending to put a key in the lock. Yeah. Are the postal carriers supposed to do that? Oh, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if there's a, I don't know if there's a regulation about this, but I feel like if they've already identified you, like they know it's you, I feel like they could have that, like my house, Uh huh. right? Like, I feel like if they see me at my house, like. Okay, but like also that's the thing. That's the scam. So Uh uh-huh. Eek. Yeah, they're not really supposed to. To hand you your mail. Theoretically, like if you're if you walk out from inside your house. Inside, yeah. And they see you get they can hand you the mail. Mm -hmm. Or if you were to go and find them and provide them proper ID. Mm At their discretion, they can hand you the mail. Mm -hmm. They don't have to. And now most of them will not. Most of them won't. Yeah. Like my mail carry will. Right. But I have one on my house. Right. Yes. Like old old school style. Right. So it's a little different. If I'm outside, yeah, sure. Uh Easy. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, but you know, the same mail carriers, they Mm -hmm. know the neighborhood. Yes. You know? Yeah. They're not supposed to, and they can get in a lot of trouble. They can lose their, their, uh, their job if they hand mail to somebody. To the wrong person. Yeah. It's not addressed to. So I wondered how much the chiropractor scheme would Mm. get for Tom. So Mrs. De Silva's bill was forty two dollars and fifty cents. But a, like in that time, in in nineteen sixty, yeah. How how much buying power would forty two dollars and fifty cents have now? I'm gonna go with like a hundred and fifty. Oh, well, that I would. That was close to what I would have guessed. It's actually about four hundred and fifty dollars. Yeah, what? one dollar now. Oh, I'm sorry. $1 in 1960 had the same buying power as $10. What? Over over $10 in 2024. What? Uh Uh-huh. Oh, my gosh. This is why my mom could uh, go to the movies, get popcorn and a drink for a quarter when Mm -hmm. she was a kid. Well, yeah, but like, (laughs) wow. Uh Uh-huh. Dang. And then Charles Reddington's $27 bill would be about $285 now. Dang. Yeah. So I wondered how accurate the chauffeur's license used as ID at the bank was. Yeah. I mean, that's weird. Yeah. I have no idea. Yeah. I didn't either. So I looked it up. So in 1941, they introduced the three-year chauffeur's license, and it stayed the same or basically the same. (laughs) For 30 years. Oh, okay. Then. <laughs> so it doesn't exactly look like it did in 1941, but close enough. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty amazing. Yep. <laughs> of course, there must have been something at least a little off about it mm-hmm. because the cashier took it to her boss mm-hmm. and they were like, mm, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. It's just. It's still a picture ID, but it does seem very easily faked. 
Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Why not a regular ID? You yeah. know. Questions. So is a Trani a real place? <sighs> no. Oh. No, it is. Really? I just didn't. I know. (laughs) It is the smallest village in Italy right there on the Amalfi Coast. Oh, my gosh. Mm -hmm. Please, I kind of wish it wasn't real. Oh, really? (laughs) Because I want it to be so idyllic and out of touch. And it really, the fact that it's real means you could go there. Oh, yeah. But it means I can't go there. (laughs) So it'd be better if it was just a fantasy. (laughs) Oh, it's so Mm -hmm. pretty. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, they did look at at locations on the little island where the talented Mr. Ripley was filmed, but the director really fell in love with the Trani Mm -hmm. and decided he was just going to set it there There. and that it's got its like original medieval structure, all those little steps, all the steps and the covered walkways and the little gardens and the, the houses set into the the, uh, cliffs there. All of that is... Real and oh my God. yeah, I know. Gorgeous. I just this is so funny because the the postmaster guy Sue 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 everything is up and over there uh-huh. up yeah. and over there yep up, up and up, over there up 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 up, up 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 like five flights of stairs that's what I heard five flights of stairs mm-hmm. up so 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 yeah <laughs> yeah you go up and up. And up uh, and all, do you see Tom yeah. like uh, shoulders going down and down and down? Yes. Every time the post a lot. Order. Yeah, it was a lot. Tom was on the Orient Express, and I wondered if he was pretentious for using the fountain pen to write the letter to mm-hmm. his aunt, or if that was normal in 1960. I th- I'm going to go with one of those transitional moments because I feel like. Yes, some upper crust individuals probably still had them. It probably is what gave him away as being quote unquote new money to have a fountain pen on the train. Uh Like, come on, like in your office, one thing, Uh but like as your travel instrument, like you're just trying to like signal, you know, it feels a little weird. They had regular pins. (laughs) So yes, I feel like it's one of those transitional moments where it probably existed some people probably had their little thing and they used them, but mm-hmm. probably also it's just one of those moments where it's like, ah, oh, new money. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> to use a Titanic reference. Uh-huh. All I can think is Molly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it is definitely a transitional moment. Okay. That is for sure. So ballpoint pens mm-hmm. were really first patented in 1943 by Laszlo Brio and his brother. The rights to that patent would be bought by the Royal Air Force Mm -hmm. for use in World War II because fountain pens at the high altitudes Mm -hmm. didn't work properly, but ballpoint pens did. Mm -hmm. So that was what they were used for for a long time. The first public release of ballpoint pens were about $10 each and available in 1945. That's about $175 in today's money. I mean, so, so much for a ballpoint pen, right? (sighs) They didn't end up in the American market until about 1959. Mm Mm-hmm. And they were over $3 a piece then, which was much, much cheaper. Well, they were 29 cents a piece, but that's $3 of buying power now. Okay, okay. Sorry, yeah, I misspoke. That was, they were 29 cents a piece. Yeah. But that was still kind of a lot yeah. for a pen. But within a year, they became, they came down to the equivalent of about a dollar. Okay. So 10 cents. Yeah, because it became the quantity. Right. And all of that. Yes, the yes, the mass. So the American market. So 1960, you could really go either way. Yeah. Like, you know, maybe you don't have three dollars to spend on a pen. Right. Or the equivalent of three dollars to spend on a pen. Your 29 cents is just a little too much for the pen because you already have the inkwell and the the pen. Yeah. If you already have. Yeah. But refilling that ink, it's kind of like, do you buy ink or do you buy a new printer today? I mean, uh-huh. the ink, <laughs> right? Like, uh, you know, for that matter, pencil. Right. 
I feel like also pencils, pencils like yeah. for travel and things. You uh-huh. travel on a train, shaky little ink, uh huh. You know, and all of this stuff. It feels very like no, just have a pencil, mm-hmm. you know, or something like that. If you didn't have a a ballpoint pen, or uh, I would agree, but. But you so know, it was so. it was a transitional moment where I could have seen him yeah. kind of it wasn't necessarily pretentiousness on Tom's part. OK, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. So Dickie suggests lodging for Tom. Mm-hmm. He suggests the Hotel Miramare. Um, is that a real place? I hope so, because now the village is real and now I want the hotel to be real. OK, but so. I'm going to probably say it's not mm. because we did say that they used the convent Right, and then they rented a house. So yes. I'm going to guess that, like, probably it's not a real place, but maybe it's inspired by a place. Okay, so it's definitely real, but it's not in Atrani. Okay, all right. So Miramare is in Postano. Postano is the city that Patricia Highsmith patterned the fictional city in the book oh, after. Okay. So they're about... 11 miles apart on the coast. Okay. So Miramare is a real place. It was started in the 1930s by a guy, Carlino Cinque, and he had a house and just basically rented out the rooms, hoping that he could someday Mm -hmm. make it into a hotel. And eventually he did. Um, But it kind of got popularized because it became a rest facility for allied officers um, during Ooh, World War II. Interesting. So um, you can go and stay there, but I would really highly recommend you make sure that you look at photos and read reviews before you stay there so that you know exactly what you're actually getting. I have to look at photos. Um, because, yes, the fictionalized, the Miramare, it is not quite what it seems like in the show. Okay. Somebody who originates from Las Vegas, Nevada, stayed there in September of 2018. She said she really liked it, but you have to understand it's not an American hotel. It is a very typical Italian hotel, and there is a difference uh, there. Somebody else who stayed there a month later, who was from London, said it was basically just a step up from a hostel. Oh, okay. So hmm, then... Uh, in April of 2022, somebody from Sweden said that the rooms were very clean and tidy and they found it modern and really liked it. Somebody who stayed there in September of 23 said that they found it really run down. It has a communal toilet. Mm-hmm. You don't have a, a bathroom in your own room. Right. And that the elevator was really old fashioned and people got stuck in it. <laughs> So you really got to know uh, what you're willing to yeah. uh, put up with. It is an old place. It's been there since the 30s. It's nearly 100 years old. Come on. The, this this we website, understand. though? It's quite nice. Right? This website is so cool. Like, I'm scrolling through, and I'm like, wow. It's really nice. Mm-hmm. And like, the translation's mostly really good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like and they have different they have different rooms, so I'm wondering, yeah, who who spent money for what? Uh huh. Like, Cause... well, and the people who really liked it may have been the ones who like spent a little more on the nicer rooms. Uh, maybe so because they have an apartment. Ooh. Ooh, they have an apartment, a queen, classic, superior, deluxe, and junior suite. Okay, so let's see. Wow, wow. I mean, this apartment. The views are gorgeous. It's the Amalfi Coast. Come on. I mean, seriously. Yeah. Double bathroom ensures comfort of home to each guest. Walk-in closet, all of the things. Oh, yeah. All the things. Mini bar. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Oh, my gosh. Of course, it doesn't list a price, which is how you know it's probably very expensive. Mm-hmm. But you, but it has food. There's a, there's a. Oh, there's like a whole restaurant yeah. in there, and I'm like, I'm sorry, if I'm going to Italy, I'm not cooking. Oh yeah, definitely. I'm not. eating all of the pasta. N- yes, yes, and I have pasta at least once a week, and mm-hmm. that's all I want to eat over there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> is have somebody else cook uh-huh. good pasta. That's right. Oh yeah, none yeah. of that, none of that stuff that's been dried. No, 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 fresh pasta. Uh-huh. Yes, mm-hmm. so nice. 
<laughs> and all the fish, the Mediterranean no. diet. That's what's oh. so hard to uh, prepare here because it's so much money to get all the little tiny things you need to make it happen. Yeah. And then you have to have time to make all the little things happen. Uh-huh. And it's much easier at a restaurant level. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it is. You know? Or at least on a coastal level. Yeah, coastal right? level. And then and then the restaurant level is just way easier. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And I didn't know where else to put this. So um, Euro News had an article about the artwork. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm only going to talk about the artwork that we see in the first episode. Okay, good. And kind of how it uh, gives you clues about what's happening. So (laughs) the first, like, thing that we see that Tom admires is a portrait that's in the window of the antique shop. Right. right? Okay. Um, That is Augustus John by Sir William Orpin. And that one dates back to 1900. Mm -hmm. It shows that Ripley is drawn to this like wealth and opulence that he can't really quite afford. He's Mm -hmm. got an appreciation of it, but also um, the painter was a close friend of the subject in that particular painting. So it kind of is foreshadowing Tom and Dickie's relationship. Then we see the Picasso, Mm -hmm. the guitar player is from 1910 and it's just like there. It's It's not behind glass. It's just hung on the wall. Mm -hmm. It's like there, this like easy sort of wealth that, yeah. Dickie has and Tom can't really imagine. Right. Right. So that's kind of where that is also opportunity. Mm-hmm. Like that would be an easy thing to like pick up and walk away with. Maybe and, so. Like, yeah. I mean, it's hung there without glass in an open air, uh-huh. sea air. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Not great. Uh, but currently, that particular painting is in the National Museum of Modern Art in Paris. And I try to figure out who owned it in 1960. <laughs> but because of World War II, it's really hard oh, to follow yeah. the path of particularly European art mm-hmm. in that time frame. So who knows? Who knows? Who knows where it was? Um, and then... Dickie mentions that they should go look at the Caravaggio's. Oh, yeah. Uh Uh-huh. So Caravaggio was a a famed painter, Mm -hmm. very famous Italian painter. He was also a murderer and a known bisexual. Uh Okay. So... For that time, that's very... Yes, this is who we're talking about uh right here. Yes. Almost, do you feel like Dickie knew this and was, like, testing him? (laughs) (laughs) No, I I think... (laughs) I don't think that he was testing him, actually. I think that he had a fondness for Caravaggio Mm -hmm. paintings. Yeah, and just... Uh It was normal. But it is... The foreshadowing is funny. Mm -hmm. Yes. All of the sources that we use to inform our discussion here on Killer Fun Podcast can be found on our social media. Join us on Facebook at Killer Fun Podcast, exploring the intersection of crime and entertainment. You can find us on Twitter at Killer Fun Pod, or you can send us an email at killerfunpodcast at gmail.com, and I'd be happy to share a link to whatever information you're looking for. We love to hear from you. You might learn a little something, too. Psychology break. Why do scammers scam? I just, I mean, there's just, I feel like there's multiple reasons. There are, there are a lot of reasons. We're going to talk about a few. Okay. Karthik Pandian wrote an article for LinkedIn in December of 2023 that the scammers are seeking to obtain money or sensitive information, valuables through deceit, Mm -hmm. basically. They pretend to be somebody trustworthy, like a financial institution or an online marketplace, Mm -hmm. something like that, or an acquaintance, Yeah, which is what we see here. So some of their characteristics are that they're manipulative, Mm -hmm. that this is part of their nature. They're going to exploit people's emotions. Mm -hmm often through fear and urgency, sometimes less. That's kind of what we saw in the the debt collection yeah, scam. Right. They kind that's of fear. fear. Yeah, not so much in... That, uh, no, because that, with Dickie, it's a long, it's a long con. Mm-hmm. Yes. And they do tend to have a lack of empathy. 
They don't have any remorse or guilt about the people that they take money Mm -hmm. from. Uh, They're adaptable. They're going to change their techniques. Mm -hmm. I mean, Tom's not using exactly the same techniques to con Dickie as he is to con Herbert Mm -hmm. as he is to con the victims of his debt scam. Usually the motivation is financial gain. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's power and control. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, evading the police and manipulating people is yep. makes them feel superior. Mm-hmm. They're thrilled, they're challenged, and they're going to uh, use manipulation techniques in order to get the what they want. Mm-hmm. So phishing is a common one now where you're trying to get yeah. you know, sensitive information, which you'll see in the next episode is kind of rattling around in Tom's brain, but also impersonation. Mm -hmm. So that's what he was doing as the debt collector. He was impersonating Mm -hmm. a trusted entity. Social engineering is what he was doing with Dickie. He was exploiting his emotions, his trust, the pretense of a relationship. Then there are psychological factors that contribute to the success of scams. So authority bias, Mm -hmm. People uh, see somebody in a place of authority and they want to comply with their right. requests so they mm-hmm. don't get in trouble. Um, scarcity principle sounds like it's a limited amount of something, but they can also just use a sense of urgency mm-hmm. about things. And reciprocity, you do a little nice thing mm-hmm. for somebody, they want to do a nice thing back for you. Yeah. Um, and they'll exploit that. Scares. Yeah. And then uh, Tom took Dickie's pen. He mm-hmm. had he had like a nicer pen. He like noticed he's noticed the Picasso, yeah. and then he looks down at at Dickie's desk. Yeah, okay. and there's a this big beautiful black pen. And mm-hmm. then he goes to check into the Hotel Miramar, and, and he's he, he's got Dickie's pen. pen. So I was like, hmm, you a little kleptomania going yeah, on here. So. Uh, what is kleptomania and why does it happen? Mm -hmm. It is a mental health disorder. Mm -hmm. People feel like they have the urge to steal something, even if it's not of great monetary value, like they just can't help themselves. So there are three reasons that Dr. Mark Travers suggested to Forbes might be the reason for kleptomania. Uh, The first of which is a lack of impulse control Mm -hmm. um, that they just cannot control their urge to take something. Um, There is some research that suggests that it goes hand in hand with high levels of depression and that it may not actually be a disorder in and of itself for many people, that it's a symptom of their uh, another mood disorder. And this is a way that it's manifesting. So theoretically, if you could treat the underlying mood disorder, Mm -hmm. like major depressive disorder, You could help them not feel like they needed to steal. That's not going to be the case for everybody. You're making faces. Yeah. That research seems weird. Okay. (laughs) Okay. So, yeah. So, I'm I'm just listening, considering it. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the comorbidity between kleptomania and Uh and depressive disorders, certainly high. Okay. Um, But being the underlying disorder and having kleptomania as one of the symptoms... That would be breaking news oh, to me. Okay, so I was very, con- I was like, oh, that's interesting. Um, now with comorbid disorders, often you can abate the symptoms of one by treating the other, other. right? Okay. So if you wanted to abate the symptoms of kleptomania, definitely dealing with some sort of mood and likely an anxiety plus depression, um, because it's an impulse control. It means that it gives them some sort of satisfaction. So they're looking for that dopamine rush. Uh Um, but with depression, like major depression, um, as a symptom of, I would think there had to be something else there because typically with the major, you'd be too apathetic to care. Okay. Right. I mean, like for a lot of people. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I would think that for the population who had that major depressive, major depression and, um, and kleptomania, that that would be, you know, that would be a very, t- a, a certain type of comorbidity. I would more expect oh. it to be related to bipolar oh, okay. than to major depression. But that's okay. just, you know, not to say that it can't. I'm just interested. But usually, uh-huh. but a lot of times with comorbidity anyways, if you've got something that is like highly, you know, correlated so that if you have one, there's a, you know, something chance that you have another, 
you can definitely like help one, you and, know, by helping the other. Okay. So certainly, yeah. you know, right. But, um, but yeah, I would I would be surprised, you know. It would be interesting research to me. I'd have to I'd dig into that. Oh, because cool. as a symptom, as an underlying symptom, as a driver, that would be surprising to okay. me. With at least with major depression. Not well, so much with the bipolar. Oh, uh, okay. Well, it looks like yeah. there's a link. So I'll oh, yeah. find that link and send it to you. Yeah, we'll have to yeah. dig into it a little bit. And it could just be an unhealthy response to stress. You yeah. don't know how to cope with stressful things that are happening in your right. life and you know that you know taking the eyeliner or mm-hmm. the pen or yeah. the whatever, whatever it is. the mm-hmm. salt shaker yeah right <laughs> whatever it is it makes you feel better yeah it makes you feel better i got away with something Yay. yeah <laughs> real life <laughs> So frauds and scams are actually different things. Mm-hmm. So fraud is uh, financial. Okay. And it is without your knowledge or permission. Right. Fraud is the thing that happens when somebody steals your mm-hmm. credit card and, you know, goes shopping with it. You And it's hard to protect yourself from that because you don't know that it's happening. Yeah. Right? I mean, all you can do is try and lock down your accounts well yeah. enough. Even then, everybody's going to fall victim at some point, yep. probably. But a scam is with someone's knowledge. So if you're the debt collector, mm-hmm. the fake investment opportunities, fake lottery winnings, oh, gosh, yeah. romance, they're called romance scams because mm-hmm. they're a scam because they're somebody is building a relationship with you yeah, in, in order, order to. to be able to take money. Mm-hmm. And then I noticed Tom was on the subway and there yeah. were ceiling fans. And I was like, ceiling fans on the subway? I hadn't even occurred to me. Well, like on the subway car. Yeah, there was ceiling fans. Oh, I and didn't I was even noticed. Like, oh. I did because, yeah. you know, I'm huh. obsessive about the details um, when I'm watching something for the show. Six years ago, wooden ceiling fans and wicker seats were not uncommon sights on the subway. In, in New York? In New York, that uh, air conditioning wasn't introduced to subway cars until the late 1950s. Mm-hmm. And it was only a very few train cars that had it. And that even by 1983, you only had a one in three chance of getting on a subway car and it having air conditioning. That is so crazy uh-huh. because I've never, you said now? No, 1983. No, 1983. Yeah. Okay. Now, now they're all. I was about to say, cause I have never, yeah, never seen that. Oh yeah. no. But, but I was just like, wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess that makes sense because it's going to, it would get stuffy down there. Did they have air conditioning? Mm-hmm. Only just. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay. Then we saw some telephone numbers. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. And they started with letters. And I was like, oh, I'd like to know more about that. Yeah. I know that used to be a thing. Mm-hmm. Well, 1921, when you wanted to call a number, you talked to an operator. And then later in 1921, they changed out... You didn't always talk to an operator. Often you did, but they changed it so that you had a three-letter, four-digit system. Uh And then in 1948, it was two letters and five digits, which Mm -hmm. is what we see in Ripley on the cards. Mm -hmm. That officially lasted until 1977, (laughs) which I'm like, that's wild. That is wild. But they basically... The letters correspond to numbers if you see, yeah, you know, if you look. That's why the letters are on the numbers. Uh huh, exactly. Yeah. So, like, if you, you know, 1 800, yeah. Call Bob's, <laughs> you know, I don't know if, uh, or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Call Bob, you know, those are the numbers yeah. that you would die or you would dial. Yeah. You don't die them, you <laughs> dial them. Um, so, I wanted to know what. The meanings of the letters were. Yeah. There's a lot of meanings, and they may or may not be related to streets or mm-hmm. um, landmarks in an area. A lot of them got reused from city to city, so they, yeah, it may or may not have to do with anything. But Herbert Greenleaf had LK, and the IRS agent John Rudolph had JL. So I'm like, wait, those are fives. 
mm. J K L yeah. are the the letters for five. That is Klondike. Klondike is the set aside abbreviation as opposed to lakeside or fountain or station, which are some of the others that you might have had back in the day. The, that's what the letters would correspond to. JKL are the ones that would correspond to Klondike, which is set aside for entertainment use. Yeah. Five, because five, it's five. five, five, five. Mm-hmm. So. Yep. Five, five, five. Yep. <laughs> So that's well, good what on them for yeah. like being specific about that. Yeah. All right. So next time we're going to talk about the true story of a comedian and his stalker. Mm-hmm. It's starring the comedian who was stalked, Richard Gad, and was adapted from his own one man show. And that one man show and the show that we're going to watch is called Baby Reindeer. I can't wait to see this. I can't either. It looks so interesting and like it's yeah. crimey. <laughs> but I also um, read an article that about how careful he was yeah. to because he really recognized that this woman who was stalking him was deeply mentally ill. Yeah, and he did a lot both in his one man show and in this adaptation mm-hmm. of it to make sure that she might not even be able to recognize herself in this. Okay. This is more about like his story. Right. Like his his part of the story, he understands that she's right. yeah. someone in need of protection as well. And I really appreciate no, that. I appreciate so I feel that too. I feel good about it. Yeah. yeah. Thanks so much for listening. We know you make a choice when you listen to us. We don't just come on the radio that it is something you choose to do share us with a friend because it is way more fun when you listen with a friend and until next time be safe be kind and wash your hands